So welcome everybody to our presentation this evening. Our, it's a presentation called Why Black and White? And it's been given to us by Cole Thompson. So Cole is an American photographer. He's based in Colorado, though he just admitted to originally coming from Orange County in California. Uh, he described himself as being uniquely unqualified to speak on photography. And a direct quotation from Cole is, photography class or a workshop. I don't have a degree in art. I've never worked as a photographer. I don't have gallery representation. I'm not a Canon explorer of light. And I only have three lenses and none of them are primes. Do I have any qualifications? Just one, my images, nothing else matters. So that's very intriguing. And I must admit, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Cole has to say and how he, he describes all of that. Before I hand over to Cole, uh, I just want to remind you, please, that if you have any questions as we go through uh, the presentation, please um, put them into the chat. And at the end of the presentation, I'll read them out to Cole and, and, um, and pass them on on your behalf. So Cole, uh, it's marvelous to see you. Thank you very, very much for being here. And um, I'm gonna stop talking now and, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. It's uh, about noon here in Colorado. So I've got an easy day of it. Uh, I'm just gonna launch in. Let me start by sharing my screen. Paul, give me a thumbs up if you can see that. I can indeed, Cole, yes, thank Good. you. Good. My presentation is called Why Black and White? And it's really, I kind of tricked you a little bit. It's not really about black and white, as it is about something else much more important than black and white. We'll see if you can figure out what that is. I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't distract myself. So let's get started. To understand black and white, we first must examine the history of black and white. We need to undertake a comparative and historical analysis with an emphasis on the relative intrinsic value of the inherent intermodal causeways of the medium when compared to other artistic disciplines. Now, did anyone understand that? I didn't. Unfortunately for you, this is an incredibly boring part of the presentation. So let's get started. In the beginning, all art was created in black and white. But then color was invented and the world turned colorful. But then photography was invented and it turned back to black and white. And then coat of color was invented and it turned back to color. The end. That's about all we need to know about the history of black and white. Now, how many of you would buy a three-legged dog or get on an airplane with only one wing or buy a car with no wheels? So why then would you take a perfectly good color image and strip it of all color? Why? It would be like driving a Model T in a Tesla world, or using wet plate photography in a digital world. It would just be incomplete, sort of like owning a three-legged dog. Tonight, I'd like to talk about my journey to black and white and why you might consider it. My story begins in 1967 when I was living in Rochester, New York as a 14-year-old boy. Now, Rochester is the home of Kodak where really modern photography began. And I was out for a hike one day when I stumbled across an old ruin of a home. And I learned that it had once been owned by George Eastman, the founder of Kodak. And that piqued my interest. So I checked out his biography and began reading about photography. And before I had finished that book, I just fell in love with photography. And I just felt it was my destiny to become a photographer. And for the next 10 years, I did nothing but photography. If I wasn't shooting, 
I was holed up in a dark room for hours and hours. Or looking at the work of the famous black and white photographers from the 40s and 50s. And as I looked at their work, I fell in love with these very dark images, very contrasty images. And I was just drawn to them. And when I saw an image that I loved, it would cause this shudder to go down my spine. And they inspired me. And I wanted to create images just like these. This is my very first fine art image created at the age of 14. Now, a lot of people will ask me, but Cole, why black and white? You were born into a color world. And I tell them, no, I wasn't. I was born into a black and white world. When I was a boy, television was all in black and white. Movies were in black and white. My childhood heroes were in black and white. News was delivered in black and white. Everything in my world was black and white. Even my nation was still segregated into black and white. And so I created black and white images. And perhaps those images are an extension of the world that I grew up in. For me, color records the surface, but black and white reveals the feelings that lie beneath the surface. Or put another way, color is a happy meal and black and white is fine dining. Now, what do I look for in a great black and white image? Well, as I mentioned, I love a dark image. I love a glowing subject. I love detail, especially when the detail is enhanced with contrast. I love simple shapes textures and patterns. And increasingly, my work is becoming more and more simple, often through the use of a long exposure. I use a long exposure often with water, with skies, and I even use the long exposure with people. This image is called the Angel Gabriel. And I call it my most significant image because it was the very first time that as I stood there, I could see the final image in my head. I was photographing on the Newport Beach Pier in Southern California, and there were hundreds of people walking past me. But because I used a long exposure, they disappeared, except for those couple of ghosts who lingered for just a second. And the image was interesting, but it was lacking something, a subject. So I looked around for someone I could ask to stand in my image when I saw this homeless man eating French fries from a trash can. And I approached and asked him if he would stand in my image, I'd be happy to take him to lunch. And he reluctantly agreed. And he wanted to hold his Bible. And it turns out that his name was Gabriel. So I called the image the Angel Gabriel. Afterwards, I took Gabriel to a very nice restaurant. And imagine walking in with a homeless man who is barefoot, filthy, and matted hair. As we sat and looked at the menu, I said to Gabriel, order anything that you like. And he said, I'd love a steak with mushrooms and onions. I haven't had one in years. And when the waitress brought it, he ate his food with his hands. Gabriel was a delightful fellow. He had been a drug addict, but was now clean. It turns out that Gabriel was from Romania, and I'm half Romanian, so we had that in common. And as we were getting ready to part ways, I learned that his father lived nearby. And I said to Gabriel, give me your father's name and address, and if I sell any of these images, I'd be happy to share a portion with you. To which he replied, give it to someone who really needs it. I have everything that I need. And Gabriel walked away with his only two possessions, his Bible and a bedroll. So how do you learn to photograph in black and white? Well, here's what I do. First, I put my camera into monochrome mode and raw mode, and is the important word. In monochrome mode, it lets me see the image in black and white on the back of the camera. That's very useful. But because I'm shooting in raw mode, the image comes into Photoshop as a color image. 
Now, why would a black and white photographer want to record the image in color? It's because I don't want the camera to make those black and white decisions for me. Let me illustrate. These two images, same scene, but in the upper left, I let the camera record the image in black and white. In the lower right is a color image that I converted to black and white. Now don't photograph in monochrome and JPEG mode because then it will record the image in black and white and you won't be able to do that conversion yourself. Next, learn how colors translate into shades of gray because black and white is all about contrast. And even more importantly, learn how to manipulate those colors into different shades of gray by using the Photoshop black and white conversion program. Then think in terms of shapes, contrasts, and composition. I think of a black and white image as a naked image. If you don't have a good composition, it's readily apparent. Now, what subjects look great in black and white? Well, I honestly believe they all do, except for one, unicorns. Those should always be photographed in color. Now tonight, I'd like to share with you a sampling of my work. I'd like to show you images from each of my different portfolios interspersed with some of my photographic philosophies. Now a portfolio is simply a group of images that are related or they tell a story. And for years, I resisted working in a portfolio. I called myself a photographic grazer. I just like to go wherever the grass was greener. Well, I created some good images, but they just weren't related in any way. A few years later, I decided to submit my work to Lenswork, which I believe is the finest black and white publication on the planet. And the submission guidelines were very simple. Submit 15 to 25 images on a single subject. And then it said in capital letters, do not send us your greatest hits. Well, I thought to myself, he's never seen my greatest hits. And so off they went. Well, they came back in just a few days with a big handwritten note that said, pick one image and send me 20 on that subject. And that was the kick I needed to begin my very first portfolio, grain silos. I live in the edge of the Great Plains, right where the Rocky Mountains begin. And everywhere you go, you will see these grain silos or grain bins. They're at the center of every family farm, and they're at the heart of every small town. And so for nine months, I traveled the Great Plains, trying to look at these grain silos, not as objects of utility, but rather as objects of art. And that was my first project and my first project to make it into lens work. And the big takeaway, the big lesson that I learned from this was that I love projects. And I don't know why I resisted working in a project for so long. Now, I've heard you don't consider yourself a photographer. No, I now think of myself as an artist who uses photography. But for 35 years, I did think of myself as a photographer and I had a photographer's mentality. As a photographer, I almost worshiped my equipment. If you were to observe me, you might conclude my equipment was more important than my images. But now as an artist, my God is the image and my camera is simply a tool. As a photographer, my goal was to document and to show you what I saw with my eyes. But now as an artist, my goal is to show you what I'm seeing through my vision inside my head. And there's nothing wrong with documenting Nothing wrong with being a photographer, but I wanted to create images. I wanted to do more. Melting giants. A few years ago, I just overheard a couple of men talking about the great icebergs that came along the coast of Newfoundland. So I jumped in my car and one month and 9,000 miles later, created this portfolio. When I got to Newfoundland, I saw this as a very sad thing. 
These icebergs begin their very short life in Greenland, where they break off from a glacier, spend nine to 12 months circling in the ocean until they come along the coast of Newfoundland. There they break into these smaller pieces and they run aground, rock in the surf and then break apart, melting on shore as 30,000 year old ice cubes. And that just saddened me. And so I created these images as very dark and very contrasty. But the actual conditions I was working under were quite delightful. Bright blue skies, sunny days. Ansel Adams. When I was a 14 year old boy, Ansel Adams was my hero. I loved his work. I loved the look of his work and I tried to imitate it. I would actually go to Yosemite and try to learn where he stood to take his iconic images. And I tried to recreate them. There was no greater compliment that anyone could give me than to look at one of my images and say, that reminds me of an Ansel Adams. And I'd beam with pride. Well, a few, about 10 years ago, I decided to go to review Santa Fe. That's where you take your work and you show it to experts in the field, hoping to be discovered. And I got to the last reviewer of a very long day, showed him my work, and he looked at it very briefly and brusquely pushed it back to me and said, it looks like you're trying to copy Ansel Adams. And I replied, I am, I love Ansel Adams. And he then said something that would change my life forever. He said, Ansel already did Ansel. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? Wow, what an epiphany. It suddenly occurred to me, was that my life's ambition to become known as the world's greatest Ansel Adams imitator? Can you imagine if Paul introduced me that way tonight? Tonight's guest speaker is Cole Thompson. He is the foremost imitator of Ansel Adams photographs. Or did I have something to say of my own? And that set me forth on a two year journey to find out what was vision and did I have one? Monoliths. Every September, I go to a small town on the Oregon coast called Bandon. I fell in love the first time I saw the coast here because it's got a two mile stretch of beach with these amazing monoliths that stick straight up out of the sand. And so every year I go to photograph these magnificent beings. And every year the light is a little bit different. The weather is a little bit different. And most importantly, my vision is a little bit different. And I always come home with something new that I love. So vision, what is it? I'd heard people use the word. I understood the context in which they use the word, but I really couldn't tell you what it was. Is it a style that you develop? Is it a look or a technique? Is it a creative talent that you're born with? Is it something that some people have and others do not? Well, it turns out that it's none of those things. Vision is simply the sum total of our life experiences that allows us to see the world in a unique way. Imagine if you could take everything you've ever been taught everything you've experienced, everything that you've learned and put it into a blender and take that mix and cast lenses that you then saw the world through. And what you see through your life lenses is your vision. It is simply how you see. Now, vision can't be learned or developed. You don't take a course on vision, come out with a certificate and your vision but rather vision must be discovered. And I use the word discovered purposely because the greatest truth that I learned about vision is that we all have one. You can't not have a vision because it is simply how you see. Why is vision so important? Because it's the difference between an average image and a great image. It's what puts your mark on it. It's what gives your image its spark of life. Your image is the key difference between 
just taking a picture and creating an image. Trees from a train. In the 1970s, I lived in Alaska, but sadly never returned. Never took my family there on vacation, never went back to visit old friends. And I always regretted that. Well, in October of 2019, just before COVID, a friend calls me up and says, I've got a two for one airline ticket deal and I'm going to Alaska. Would you like to join me? And I jumped at the chance. I didn't know what I wanted to do in Alaska, but we were landing in Fairbanks. I knew, and I knew there was this great 12 hour train ride from Fairbanks to Anchorage, going through some of the most rugged and isolated parts of Alaska. So off we went and we were so lucky because on that day we had this great snowstorm. Well, when you get on a train, the first thing you do is you grab a window seat, you get your camera out and you start looking for something to photograph. And I quickly realized this was gonna be challenging. I'm basically speeding through a tunnel of trees in the middle of a snowstorm. So there wasn't a lot to see. So I went between two cars, opened up both doors and began photographing. The only subject there was, the trees. First, I just photographed them. Then I started panning with the trees. Then I asked myself, what would happen if I used a long exposure and I panned with the trees? And after the first shot, it just blew me away. I didn't understand what it was, but I loved this incredible swirling that I was seeing. And so for the next 12 hours, I just played learning to control the swirl, as I called it. And it wasn't really until I got home that I began to understand what was happening. The swirl was coming about because of all these motions combined. The trees are going one way. I'm going the other way on the train. I'm panning with the trees. But the real secret was my shutter, a focal plane shutter that moves from top to bottom. And all of these motions combined created the swirl. And even though I understand it, I'm still amazed when I look at an image like this that leaves the subject standing still with a 360 degree swirl around it. And that was on a recent cover of Lens Work. So how did I find my vision? I didn't even understand what vision was, so how could I find it? Well, I did the most logical thing I could think of. I Googled it, how to find your vision. And all I could find were articles about my eyesight. So without any direction, I just came up with 10 steps that I thought would help me find out if I had a vision. I was just making this up because I had no direction. The first thing I did is I printed out my favorite images, made physical prints, and I divided them into two piles, images that I really, really loved and everything else. Now that might sound like a simple exercise. Who doesn't know what they love? Well, I didn't. I was so confused by what others loved and what was popular that I didn't really know what I loved. So I had to learn to separate what I loved from what others loved. Next, I looked at that small pile and I asked myself, what do I love about each one of these images? I didn't ask myself what they had in common. That wasn't important. And I learned a lot about my vision there. I learned that I love dark images, centered images. I love shooting things that no one else ever does. Next, I committed to never again producing work that I didn't really love. If I came across a sunset that I knew would be wildly popular, that I didn't love it, I didn't pursue it. It's what I call creating honest work, staying true to what I loved. Next, I practice photographic celibacy, a controversial idea. I don't look at the work of other photographers. Why not? I found myself so easily swayed by what others were doing, their look, their subjects, their style, that I reasoned that if I was going to find my vision, I needed to stop immersing myself in other people's vision. Next, I had to change my mindset from photographer to artist. 
I brought with me a lot of bad habits as a photographer. And now I needed to learn to create images. And the hardest one of all, I had to stop caring what other people thought of my work. I had to create images that I loved, even if it meant no one else loved them. And it took me two very hard, very long gut-wrenching years to finally find my vision. And at times I wanted to quit and give up because I didn't feel like I was making any progress. The problem was I was looking for a very complicated answer as to what vision was. And it turns out that vision is so very, very simple. It is how I see things, how I like them, how I would like them to be, how I imagine they could be. But I find describing vision with words isn't very effective. So I'd like to show you some before and after images to show you what I saw with my eyes and then show you what I saw with my vision. Let's start with the angel Gabriel. As I mentioned, this is my most significant image because it was the very first time that I could envision the image as I stood there. Now, what's the value of that? Well, it becomes a roadmap, not just for the shot, but for the post-processing. Here's my before and after image. Because I could see that final image, it helped me because I was brand new to Photoshop. I was only in Photoshop for about a year or two, and I didn't know how to do much, but I had a roadmap. And I can learn techniques and tools. Vision was the key. Here's an image called Skeleton, a pile of bones laying along the river in my hometown, exactly as they lay. And I remember as I stood there looking at the bones saying, I can see this image, there's dark leaves with these bright bones shining through. But that's not what my eyes saw. My eyes saw very bright leaves and bright, very bright bones. So again, my roadmap helped me. I learned a new technique and I learned how to use Photoshop to convert what my eyes saw into what my vision saw. This is a relatively new image from Death Valley called Moonset, Death Valley. And this is the before and the after. Now, I never let my eyes limit me. My eyes can grab my attention, but it's my vision that I'm creating for, not my eyes. Now, some people will say to me, after seeing your before and after images, I realize I need to learn a lot more about Photoshop. And that is exactly not my point. Some people think that you've got to have the great technical skills before you can express your vision. And I so disagree with that approach. I believe in finding my vision first, and then I learn the tools, learn the skills that I need to express my vision. When I created my series, The Ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau, I didn't know how to create ghosts but I had a vision of what I wanted. And so I learned the tools. And I think this is an example of how different I saw things with my eyes than how I saw them with my vision. This is my favorite iceberg from the Melting Giants series. And he almost didn't make it into the portfolio because all of those images were long exposures. But this iceberg was rocking so badly, I couldn't get a long exposure. And so I simply took a still image of him and then said, I will find a way later in Photoshop to turn that into a long exposure. And I did. And it's indistinguishable from all the other long exposures in that series. This is an image from Linny, a series of breast cancer. And the before and after. And again, I never let my eyes limit me. It doesn't matter what I'm seeing. It it's matters what I'm imagining through my vision. This is Lone Man number 20 from my Lone Man series. The before and after. Now my post-processing is extremely simple. I typically use six tools in Photoshop and I doubt anyone has a simpler post-processing routine. Here's my six steps. And I'd like to just very briefly show you how I process an image. 
First, I bring my color image into the raw converter. And you'll remember it's in color because I shot in raw. And all I do is play with the sliders here until I can make the image as close to my vision as possible. The next step is where some of the real magic begins, converting the color image into black and white using the conversion program. I use those color sliders to drastically change the look of the image. Let me give an example. These four images are all the same color image. And the only thing I've done different is change two of the color sliders. Look how different they look. And that's why I never wanna shoot in black and white and let the camera or let Photoshop decide what the black and white image should look like. Step three is where I adjust my levels. And that simply means I ensure I have a true black and a true white. You can't judge this by your monitor. You have to look at the histogram. Step four is where I dodge and burn. This is a darkroom technique that I brought over in the digital. And by using a pen and a tablet, I can work on very small areas of the image without affecting the entire image. And in this image, I darkened and vignetted the sky. I brought out some detail in that frothy foam in the center. And I darkened some of the distracting detail in the foreground. Step five, I add contrast. Now I love contrast, but I add it for a more practical reason. When you print a black and white image, it often doesn't have the same look and feel as the on your monitor. And that's just the nature of a physical print. So by adding contrast, I can make up for a lot of that and make it look about as good as the monitor image. And the sixth step, I simply spot my image because I always have a dirty sensor. And here's your before and after. <clears throat> Popular photography called me the Photoshop heretic because they said I did everything wrong. And I, they were joking, of course, there is no wrong way to use Photoshop, but I love a simple approach. I don't like to have a lot of complicated procedures in my post-processing. And I hope this will illustrate, you can have a very simple procedure and still produce good work. Now I'd like to share the real secret to post-processing more important than those six steps. It is knowing what you want to do, not knowing how to do it. Anyone can learn how to do it. When I stand before a scene, I always can see the final image in my head. That's my vision. The problem is there are other voices in my head. How did Ansel do it? How would the judge in my local camera club like it? How has my mentor taught me to see? And all these other voices push out our vision. We really have to say, how do I see this scene? Not how others see it. Isolated. Isolated is a very simple project about isolation as expressed through trees. And this is an open project. I've got several of these open projects, meaning I haven't completed them yet. And I like having them because no matter where I go in the world, I can find something to add to one of these open projects. For example, I just came back from Guam and added this new image. When I was up in Newfoundland, I heard about the Bay of Fundy. It's famous for having the highest tides in the world, over 55 feet. So I wanted to photograph this at high tide. Problem was when I got there, it was low tide. And I had to wait around until after 10 o'clock for the tide to come up. I positioned myself down at the bottom stair going to the bay. And by the time the tide had come up, my tripod was partially submerged. And it was so dark that I had to use a flashlight to illuminate part of the scene. And I had to use an eight minute exposure but I got the shot. Now, sadly, I just saw last year that erosion finally took down those Hopewell rocks. So I'm glad I got there before they were destroyed. 
So I love going to a new location and people will ask me, how do I prepare? Well, I don't. When I go to a new location, I only do two things. I book a flight and I rent a car. That's it. I do not book hotels in advance. I don't want to limit myself as to where I'll be. I do not look at the work of other photographers from that area. And I never, ever purchase a guidebook so that I can see where the must-see sites are. Now, why don't I want to see the must-see sites? Because they've been photographed a billion times before by a million other people. When I go to Death Valley, I always laugh because I see dozens of photographers all lined up to take this one famous shot. They wait for the sun to hit Manly Beacon. They take the shot, just like everyone else's, and then they go home because they got the shot. What they don't see is right behind them is this shot. And to the right, this shot. And a bit more to the right, this shot. And behind them, this shot because they got the famous shot and they went home. I never want to photograph the must-see sites. I want to create my own must-see sites. Ukrainians with eyes shut. A few years ago, my son, number two, was in the Peace Corps and he was assigned to Ukraine. And so my wife and I went off to visit him. And as is my practice, I made no preparations. I just went with hope and faith that I would see something that would inspire me. Well, I got there and was there for about three days and I hadn't seen a thing. And I was starting to get nervous, putting pressure on myself to find something. I found the people to be interesting, but it's always hard to photograph people in a foreign country because they always put on the big camera face, the big smile, the big mask. And you don't have a common language or time to break down that barrier. So as I was at a bus stop thinking about this problem, I saw an old man leaning against the wall. And I approached him and I tapped my chest and I said, America. And he nodded. I held up my camera. I said, photographer. He nodded. I then did the universal sign for, can I take your picture? And he nodded. And I took his picture. Then using sign language, I said, stop, close your eyes. And he scrunched his face up as if to say, what? And I said it again, close your eyes. And I took his picture a second time. And it got rid of the camera face. And it broke down those barriers. And I liked the look. And so for the next 10 days, I found myself walking the streets of Ukraine, stopping people and using sign language asking if I could photograph them with their eyes shut. This was a, a grandfather who was collecting water from a sacred spring for his ailing wife. And a groundskeeper at a monastery that had once had a thousand monks, but today has a single one. And a Cossack playing for money on the streets of Lviv. This was my son's supervisor, Natasha. She lived in the town of Beroslav in the Kherson. Oblast, but was evacuated by the Russians and forcibly made a Russian citizen. Now we can't get her out of the country because it's difficult to travel to a Western country with a Russian passport. This was an interesting story that I hadn't thought about until recently. This was a, a young man who just would not close his eyes for me. He would open one eye, he would make a face, just a jokester. And he told me that he was a comedian and would one day be the president of Ukraine. And as I told the story, people started asking me, is that Zelensky? And I said, I don't believe so, but let me ask my son. And my son found this picture of Zelensky at about the same age. And my son doesn't think so. The coloration is difficult to tell, but it was an inter interesting story. And then finally, I was on the streets of Lviv when a little old man, five foot nothing, came shuffling up and asked in very broken English what I was doing. And I explained, and then he just shuffled away. A few minutes later, he came shuffling back with a camera in hand and said, can I take your picture? And I said, sure. And he said, with your eyes closed. 
And he took this picture of me with my eyes closed. And I was grateful for the experience because it, it caused me to realize how trusting people had been to allow me to photograph them with their eyes closed. They probably were thinking, is this a joke? Is it a trick? Are my possessions safe? <clears throat> Do you dance? This is a story that, that I heard told by a Saturday on the Navajo Indian Reservation in their emergency clinic. When an old man with long gray hair walked in and just stood and stared off into the distance. Well, the physician grabbed a clipboard and approached the man and said, can I help you? And the old man said nothing. And the physician, just a little upset, said, look, I can't help you if you won't talk to me. And the old man turned and looked at the physician and said, do you dance? And this caused the physician to ponder that for a moment. And he wondered if this wasn't maybe a medicine man who believed in healing through song and dance. And so he says, no, I don't dance. Can you teach me? And the old man said, I can teach you to dance, but you must hear the music. And that reminded me of a story about my wife and I when she came home one day and said, I've signed us up for dance lessons so we can go out dancing. And how I learned to dance was quite a bit different than how my wife learned. I learned by memorizing the dance steps. I would stare off into the distance and I would count out loud. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And as you can imagine, I was rather stiff and stilted. But my wife, she learned by closing her eyes, listening and feeling the music and flowing with it. We were quite a contrasting pair. And I remember the first time we went out dancing, my wife whispered into my ear, are you gonna count out loud all night? I had learned to dance by learning the technology of dance, but I wasn't hearing or feeling the music. And the same is true about us as photographers. We often learn the technology first. We love the gear, we love the equipment, we love the processes but we must hear the music. Otherwise, we're just taking pictures. Harbinger. Son number four, Jem and I were out on a father and son outing in Utah, and it was a hot summer day. And I saw these great mud hills off to the north. And I told my son we were gonna stop and photograph them. And he started complaining. He didn't want to stop. He didn't want to go with me. Could he just stay in the car and watch a movie? And I said, no, it's way too hot to stay in the truck. You need to come with me. So we hiked a, a distance to get to these two mud hills, dark mud hills with no grass, nothing on them. And I was photographing. And the whole time, my son is complaining. How much longer can we go now? You said 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago. And the image I was working on was okay, but it was lacking something. And finally, I just got tired of Jem's complaining. And I said, fine, let's go back to the truck. And as we got back to the truck, I just looked back over my shoulder, looked at those two mud hills, and I saw a single cloud moving quickly across the sky from left to right. And I could see that in just a minute, it would be centered over my two mud hills. So I yelled to Jem, we're going back. And we ran back up that hill, set up my tripod, got the camera on, and got one shot. And I always name my images the first words that come to mind. And I named it Harbinger, which means an omen of things to come. And I loved that image. And people loved it. And they would ask me if I was going to do a portfolio of Harbingers. And I would just laugh. What are the chances of finding single clouds? But you know, the more you look, the more you see. This is a harbinger over Mount McKinley. No, Mount Whitney, excuse me, Mount Whitney. A harbinger over Tongariki in Easter Island. A harbinger over Chimney Rock in New Mexico. And this harbinger, I lay in this field for over two hours waiting for that harbinger, that cloud, to center itself over the windmill. But it just wouldn't do it. And it was there that I learned that some clouds do move across the sky quickly, like my first harbinger. 
but other clouds stand perfectly still and there they form and then dissipate, form and then disappear over and over again, but always in the same spot. This is my favorite portfolio also appeared in lens work. So how important is equipment when creating an image? Not nearly as important as we think, and certainly not nearly as important as your vision. A story. A famous photographer was invited to dinner by a wealthy New York socialite. She greeted him warmly at the door and said, I love your work. You must have a fabulous camera. He said nothing. At the end of the meal, he thanked her profusely and said, that was delicious. You must have a fabulous stove. Now, none of us believe that a great stove makes a great meal. Yet sometimes we as photographers act as though our equipment is the key to a great image. If I had to choose between the world's greatest equipment, but I couldn't have my vision, or a simple Kodak brownie with my vision, I'll take the brownie any day because I know with it, I still can create good images. I was in St. Petersburg, Russia. I was photographing at the Peterhof Palace, spent all afternoon photographing this row of trees. And when I got home, none of the images turned out as I needed them. And I was disappointed. Then I remembered I had taken a single iPhone shot for family back home, an eight megapixel tiny censored image that I then cropped and worked to create this final image. Equipment is not nearly as important as our vision. Moy Standing. When I was 17, I read all the great books by Thor Heyerdahl. He was this wonderful, I think, Norwegian uh, explorer. And the one book that really, really spoke to me was Aku Aku, the story of his visit to Easter Island. And I just fell in love with that story and always wanted to go. Well, a few years ago, my wife and I were creating our bucket list of things we wanted to do before we died. And I just happened to say out loud to her, well, I would love to go to Easter Island, but of course that's impossible. And my wife said to me, why? Why is that impossible? And so the next year off we went. And while there, I created three portfolios. This is the first of the three, Moy Standing. There are over a thousand Moy on Easter Island, but only about 30 still stand. And they stand on these sacred altars called Ahus. You don't get close to them, very sacred to the Rapa Nui people. And this is a very small portfolio about those standing Moy. Now the tallest Moy on Easter Island is here at Tongariki. This fellow right here, over 35 feet tall. And to put his size into perspective, that's a horse standing next to him. He would have been about five foot taller if he had his top knot on. Now, Thor Heyerdahl thought the great secret, the great mystery of Easter Island was, how did they move these giants 15 miles across the island? But I don't think that's the real mystery. For me, the real mystery is, why did the Rapa Nui seemingly in a single day drop their tools and walk away from all the unfinished moi? And that's an answer we'll never have. Now, one thing I always do when I go to a new country, I get to know the dogs. I love dogs. And I think that I can learn something about the people by their animals. For example, if you go to Russia, you would never pet a dog. You will likely get bit and you'll probably get rabies shots. Ask my son number two. But in Easter Island, all the dogs are strays. They just wander and they're all kind and docile and gentle. And I think that's a reflection of the Rapa Nui. What they do is they hang out at these ahus and they beg for food from the tourists. And we fell in love with this old guy. We named him Graybeard and would go by twice a day to feed old Graybeard. Cole's rule of thirds. I was at an exhibition opening night of a new body of my work in Boulder, Colorado. 
and I was entertaining guests. When a woman came up and stood next to me and looked at some of my images and said, you know, that doesn't follow the rule of thirds. And I looked at her, astounded. She could not see my images. She could only see rules followed and rules not followed. So in jest, I created Cole's rule of thirds, which states, a great image consists of one third vision, one third the shot, and one third processing. But it's the vision that is driving the shot and driving the post-processing. For too many years in my life as a photographer, I was out of balance because I only focused on the technical. And what I created was technically perfect, but they were soulless snapshots. My favorite quote about vision comes from a blind woman. Helen Keller said, it's a terrible thing to see and have no vision. The Lone Man. I was in San Diego photographing at La Jolla Cove at the children's pool. It's simply a stone jetty they've built to protect the children from the waves. And I wanted to do a long exposure to show the motion of the waves against the stillness of the jetty. But it was a beautiful summer day and there were so many people out at the end of the jetty, I couldn't find 30 or 60 seconds to do a long exposure. Finally, I just became frustrated and proceeded with the shot anyway. And I was amazed when I looked at it. All the people had disappeared because they were in motion, except for one who stood perfectly still for the entire 30 seconds. And I remembered I had seen this before, this effect, this attitude, this posture. When people stand on the edge of the earth and look out into the great expanse, they feel very small. And they think about things much greater than self. They ask themselves questions such as, why am I here? Do I matter? Do I have a purpose in life? And at that moment, when they're alone with their thoughts, I call this the lone man. And people would ask me, do you pose these people? How do you get them to stand still? And I tell them, look, they don't even know they're being photographed. They just become naturally still and pensive. Here's what I added from Death Valley last year and a favorite from the Faroe Islands. This is actually my daughter-in-law and we're on a cliff. I'm on an edge of a cliff. She's on the edge of a cliff and it just scared me because these cliffs got to be two miles high. They're just incredibly high. And she was there with my son and baby on back and there are no guardrails. And every year, several tourists do fall to their death. A lot of my friends love to engage in these very deep and esoteric discussions on subjects such as what is art and what is fine art? No one knows. And I just wanted to weigh in with my thoughts on the subject. Who cares? I only ask myself two questions. Do I like it? And would it look good on my wall? A few years ago, I had a high school senior call me up and ask me if I would take her senior portrait. And I was about to tell her, I'm really not that kind of photographer. But then she said something that caught my interest. She said, I want to do something different. So something that no one else has ever done for a senior portrait. And so we created this image called Ingrid Surrounded. And I happened to show it to a friend of mine who's got a degree in art emphasis in photography. And he said, well, you know, Cole, that really isn't a fine art photograph. And I said, Russ, why not? I, I never claimed that it was, but why not? I thought maybe there was a cow rule I was unfamiliar with. And he said, because everyone knows that in a great fine art image, the subject never smiles. And I said, how pompous, how silly. I say, create what you love no matter what it's called or what others think. Sometimes people don't understand or like my work and that's okay because I don't create it for them. At least I shouldn't. Power lines. 
ironically, this is a project that I began back in the 1990s, but never pursued because I thought it wasn't an appropriate fine art project. I created my first power line image in San Francisco back in the 90s. Loved the image. I just didn't think this power lines, that doesn't sound like a fine art project. But recently I began asking myself, wait a minute, what is a fine art project? And what do I care if it's a fine art project? I love creating these images. I'm drawn to these power lines. And so I do it because I love it. This is an image I created in New Mexico last year. And a lot of people try to guess what that big plume is. No one has ever gotten it. But it's the long exposure of a coal-fired power plant. And I photographed that thing about 100 times before I got that plume exactly how I wanted it. I just have fun with this project. I just came back from Death Valley and added this new image from there. So I find that having passion for a project is a very important ingredient. And an image I just created last week to add to the series. So how do I pick a subject for a new portfolio? Well, I don't. It picks me. I've tried writing down lots of ideas, but I've never picked one of those up. Every new project came about in a moment of inspiration. It just hit me and I had to go with it. And I'd like to tell you about one such project called Ceiling Lamps. I was standing in a hotel lobby in Akron, Ohio. And for those of you who don't know Akron, Ohio, there's not many reasons to go there. And I just happened to look up and saw this ceiling lamp in the hotel lobby. And it caught my interest. And so I pushed the table out of the way. I lay on the floor and I looked at that lamp and I photographed it. And then I started doing that everywhere that I went. And I found myself going into stores and offices looking for unique ceiling lamps. And most people would never know these were even ceiling lamps if I didn't tell them because they don't really show them how we normally look at a ceiling lamp. And I started just playing with them and mixing them up and arranging them in different ways. And then on my, on my last trip to Moscow, and I suspect my last trip ever to Moscow or to Russia, I found these three great Soviet era ceiling lamps to add to the collection. People ask me, why do you create? And I think about that. And I think we all should ask ourselves, why do we create? And I thought back to that 14-year-old boy and why he created to simply create images that he loved to please himself. But then I started learning I could use my images to get positive feedback, pats on the back, likes in today's world. Then I started trying to win contests because I argued that is proof that the image is good. And if it doesn't win, it's not good. Then I wanted to build a resume. I said, who would take me seriously if I didn't have an extensive resume? Then I went, wanted to become famous, the next Ansel Adams. And I went through my money-making phase. And then some 50 years later, I find myself once again learning to create for the same reason as that 14-year-old boy, to simply please myself, to create images that I am proud of, that I love. I've learned that I do my best work when I create for myself. Now, some of you may not know this person. She's a singer. And she said, I mean, it's nice to be acknowledged, nice for your work to be acknowledged, but it's not what you do it for. You do it for the work. And if you're doing it for the prizes, you're in big trouble. And I agree with that. The Dunes of Nude. Every January, I go to Death Valley. Why Death Valley in January? Because the temperatures are 65 to 75 degrees and the crowds are all gone. And I love spending my time on the dunes. I spend every morning and every afternoon on the dunes because that's when the sun is low and the shadows are long and the contrast is high. 
And these dunes always reminded me of portions of the human nude. So I called it the dunes of nude. So what photographic rules should you follow? And I think this is a great question for clubs who sometimes, sometimes emphasize rules. I say none, unless you wanna create average images that look just like everyone else's who are following the same rules. You remember paint by number? I don't know if this is a worldwide phenomenon, but we as children had these little kits and we had numbers and if we painted the right colors into the right numbers, we were promised we could create a masterpiece. Well, maybe not a masterpiece, but a crude imitation of a masterpiece. The truth is you don't create a masterpiece by following the numbers or by following the rules. At best, all you'll produce is a crude imitation. Ansel Adams said, the so-called rules of composition are, in my opinion, invalid, irrelevant, immaterial. And an ex-Ansel Adams imitator said, there are no need for rules when you have found your vision. Lenny, a portrait of breast cancer. Lenny was a customer of mine. She had purchased a copy of the Angel Gabriel. And about a year later, Lenny called me up and said, I've got breast cancer, I've had a mastectomy, and I want you to photograph me. And I said, Lenny, I'm so sorry to hear that, but I'm not really that kind of a photographer. She says, it doesn't matter, I want you to do it. I said, Lenny, I don't have the right equipment. I have no experience with lighting or anything. She goes, it'll be fine. I want you to do it. I said, Lenny, let me give you the name of a woman I know who specializes in this type of work. She goes, no, I want you to do it. And she wouldn't let me off the hook. This was over a period of six months. So off I went to photograph Lenny in Western, or Western Colorado. I found Lenny to be beautiful and dignified. She was insistent these images be created and shared with others. She said there was good to be done from them, but it was an uncomfortable subject, uncomfortable for me and uncomfortable for Lenny. But I had an idea of how I wanted to portray her. I had a vision. I also had a question. I had this question I wanted to ask Lenny, but I was afraid to afraid that it would ruin the mood of the shoot or that it would maybe be too personal. But finally, as we neared the end, and I was getting ready to put my equipment away, I asked Lenny my question. Lenny, what's your prognosis? And she answered, I'll be dead by Christmas. This was in August. The good news is that Lenny, this was back in 2008, Lenny is still with us. She got into an experimental treatment program and it worked. I'm so grateful that she would not let me off the hook because sometimes uncomfortable situations are good situations. Don't know if you experience this, but people are always telling me what I should do with my images. Sometimes they're polite about it. They'll say, well, if this were my image, here's what I would do. I say, don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. When I created the angel Gabriel, I was pretty excited. I had seen something, I had envisioned it, and I had created it. So I took my image and showed it to my mentor at the time. And the first words out of her mouth were, don't center the subject. Cole, I'm telling you this all the time. Don't center the subject. And I was in a quandary. What do I do, listen to my mentor or my vision? So I went home and tried cropping it differently and I hated it. She may have seen it this way, she may have done it this way, but it was my vision and my image. And I learned an important lesson. There are no experts when it comes to your vision. Another story, a photographer was exhibiting his work for the very first time. In attendance was a well-known art critic. He approached the photographer and said, would you like to hear my opinion about your work? Sure, said the photographer, let's hear it. It's worthless. 
I know, said the photographer, but let's hear it anyway. You are the only expert when it comes to your vision. Don't ask others what you should do with your images. People all the time send me an image and say, Cole, what would you do to this image? And I tell them, look, if I told you what I would do and you followed my advice and you kept following my advice, soon your images would look like mine. And believe me, you don't want that. Confucius say, they who walk in another's footsteps never finds their own path. Find your vision. Moy, sitting for portrait. This is the third portfolio from my visit to Easter Island. Getting to Easter Island is not easy. They call it the most isolated inhabited place on earth. I flew from Denver to Toronto down to Santiago, and then out to Easter Island. And on that long leg of a journey, I fell asleep and had a dream. I dreamt that the Moy were living creatures, living beings, and that I had taken two big stands and a big roll of backdrop paper and had set an, up an outdoor studio. Then I went from Moy to Moy, inviting them to come sit for a portrait. Now, what I had not realized or appreciated was that the Moy had been so poorly treated by outsiders in the past that most simply refused. Some said they were too old or too infirm to make the trek. Others said they didn't want to run into other clan members whom they had a dispute with. So after I issued the invitations, I didn't know if anyone would show up. Well, the day and hour came, and at first, no one did show up. But then slowly, some of the younger Moy started coming and sitting for a portrait. And as word got out of the positive experience, more and more of the moy came. Well, I woke up from that dream and told it to my wife, thought about it for a few minutes, and then said to her, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to invo invite the moy to come sit for a portrait. And I did invite them. And they did come. Now, of course, uh, the Moy didn't come to me, but rather I would go to them. I would photograph them under cloud cover. Then I would outline them and drop them onto a digital backdrop that I had created to make it look like they had sat in a studio. And I shot them in cloud cover because what I would do is dodge up highlights on them to make it look like they sat under studio lighting. Now, I've got no skills in any of this but I had that vision of what I wanted to do. So I learned those skills. I learned how to do all of these things. The vision was the key. And this really fulfilled a lifelong dream. I had always been in love with Easter Island. And I'm really planning on going back a second time, hopefully next year. Vision blockers. I mentioned earlier that the most important truth I learned about vision is that we all have one. Every one of you, even if you don't believe it or don't recognize it, it's impossible to not have a vision. I believe we're all born with incredible vision and creative ability, but soon we start listening to other people. I look back at my early images from age 14 to 17, and I could see that I had a vision. I didn't know it was called vision, and I didn't really understood what it did, but I had one. But then I started wearing these vision blockers. They're sort of like those blue blocker glasses they sell on television that block out the blue light, except for these block out our vision. Every time I listened to other people's advice, every time I cared what others thought, every time I conformed or followed the rules, all of these things pushed out my vision until it just became dimmer and dimmer. And I lost it. I didn't know it was there anymore. To find my vision again, I had to learn to let go of my vision blockers. And once I did that, my vision was able to emerge again. And I was able, I became free to create whatever I wanted and however I wanted. Basically, because I just didn't care what others thought. I was creating for myself how I saw things. Okay, let's take a short break. Okay, I'm back. 
So how long do projects take? I've talked about projects tonight that I've been working on for years, but I've also told you about a project that I did in nine months, my grain silos, a project I did in 12 hours, my trees from a train. Now I'd like to tell you about a project I completed in an hour and 45 minutes, because the truth is projects just take as long as they take. The ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau. When I was in Ukraine visiting my son, we had a couple of extra days. We decided to go next door to Poland, took the train over. We went to Krakow and we stayed at the city square. And while there, we were discussing what we would do with our extra two days. Now, I knew the death camps were nearby, but I didn't want to go. I am an empath or a sensitive. I take on the sad feelings of others or sad places. And I sure didn't want to go to a place called a death camp. But the family outvoted me and off we went. We took a tour over and on the bus ride over, I began to think about where I was going. And I thought, surely if there is a sacred place on earth, this must be one of them. And so I decided that I would not photograph there. I thought it would maybe be sacrilegious or at least disrespectful. And so as we got off the bus, I asked the driver if I could leave my camera gear on board. And he said, no, he would not be responsible. So fortunately, I began the tour with my gear in hand. You begin the tour by being shown a book. On the left, a beautiful black and white photograph. And on the right, a description of the person. As I looked at that photograph, I was pretty impressed with the quality of it. And I thought, this is a skilled photographer who took pride in his work. But then I began to think about this. Why are they so carefully documenting a person whom they'll either work to death or outright murder? Why? Then they took us into the room with the iconic piles, the pile of glasses, the pile of human hair used to stuff pillows and mattresses. And then the pile that really got to me, the pile of human bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. Now I'm not claustrophobic, but at that moment, I could just not breathe and I could not remain in that room. So I signaled to my family that I was going outdoors and they should complete the tour. And once outdoors, I just walked slowly, looking down at my feet, trying to catch my breath. And as I looked at my feet, I just started thinking about them. Who else had stood here and was now dead? Who else had walked in the same path that I was walking on their way to the gallows or the gas chamber? Then I started asking myself metaphorically, I wonder if those spirits still linger here at Auschwitz-Birkenau. And then this thought just came into my head. I needed to photograph their ghosts. And so I did. I began photographing ghosts. By using the other visitors in the camp and a long exposure, I turned those visitors into ghosts. They stood in proxy for those who lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau. I had two challenges. The first, each time I set up my tripod, the people would clear out of the way not wanting to ruin my shot. And they didn't understand I needed them in the shot. So I had to very quickly devise a technique. What I would do is I would stand with my back to the camera. I would play the part of the loud American and I would speak very loudly into my cell phone. And then as people would wander back in, I would use a remote shutter release to get the shot. The other challenge, I only had an hour at 45 minutes left at Auschwitz and an hour at Birkenau. I found myself literally running from location to location, trying to document these images that I could see in my head that I had to record before I left because I knew I would never be back. This is the only image that I included a living person. It had very specific meaning to me, what it meant for this man to be standing amongst the ghosts. But I never share my thoughts about what an image means. I want the viewer to have their own ideas. And so over the years, I've asked people what this image represented to them, to them. And it, it, I've learned that 
over 12 different ideas, over a dozen different things people saw in this image that I didn't. So here I was concerned about being disrespectful and I find myself running from location to location in that hour and 45 minutes. And then finally the gas chamber with the ghost escaping. I couldn't bring myself to go into the chamber, nor could I ever go back to another death camp. Now, one of the great blessings this project has brought into my life is that I've been able to meet a great many survivors of the Holocaust. I was exhibiting this work in the Dallas Holocaust Museum. It was opening night of their new gallery when I saw this woman, Edith Molnar, in a wheelchair being pushed from image to image. And as she got to each image, she would get very close up and then closely examine it. So I went up and I introduced myself and I said, hi, my name is Cole and these are my images. And I remember Edith raising this bony, crooked finger and it was shaking and she pointed at the images and said, these are my images. Edith Molnar had been interned at Auschwitz-Birkenau and had survived. I couldn't imagine what feelings these images might have brought up for her. I was also invited to speak at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and there met over 100 survivors. You know, we've heard the stories, but when you hear them firsthand and you're holding on to their hand, incredible stories of survival and of human cruelty, it really is very, very powerful, something that I'll never forget. Okay, final tip for the evening. What is the easiest way to make money from fine art photography? So your equipment. I never got into fine art photography for the money. I got into it because this is how I express myself. I can't write. I don't express myself well with words, but I hope through my images, I can express my feelings and emotions. Summary for tonight. Three-legged dogs are awesome. And so is black and white. But the real key is your vision, whether that takes you to color or any other technique. Forget the rules. Don't follow other people's advice about your vision. Find and let go of your vision blockers and just listen to the music. Thank you. Paul, I'm gonna stop my share now and turn my camera on. Thank you very much, Cole. Um, that has been an absolutely fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, I, I know I can just only speak for myself, but I really, really uh, enjoyed it. I think I've learned quite a lot uh, from what you've said. and uh, It will certainly help re in reinvigorate, revitalize my own approach to photography. And uh, hopefully everybody else who attended this evening felt the same way. And, and I can see some people putting comments into the chat uh, saying uh, uh, it was very, very good. Uh, really great presentation. Uh, so Karen, who's from New Zealand, said it was worth getting up very early. So um, and it, as I said, it is a very much an international audience. If anybody has any questions for Cole, please uh, write them into the chat and, and I'll read them out for him. And I see there is one here from Saman. Saman is from Sri Lanka. And he, first of all, says it's an awesome presentation and it's very clear and informative. And he wants to know when you're doing your long exposure uh, images, uh, are there any specific filters that you use on your lens or your camera? Yeah, I really love long exposures because it helps me simplify my images. It smooths water out, smooths sky out, gets rid of extra people. Uh, and I just love a simple image. And so to get the images I need, I can shoot up to 20 minutes. I have a set of neutral density filters. I have a five, a 10, a 13, a 15, and a 20. And uh, a lot of people go run out and buy a 10 stop and think they can do long exposures. But in bright sunlight, a 10 stop neutral density filter will only get you about three or four seconds. Uh, 13 stops is what you need to get 30 seconds in bright sunlight. So a 15 stop is a good filter to begin for most people. Okay. Um, another, <coughs> excuse me, another technical question from Neuralan. 
who wonders, how do you fix noise uh, when you're using your black and white conversion? Um, I don't get a lot of noise unless I'm using a lot of blue channel that introduces a lot of noise. And um, I don't worry too much about noise, partly because it's a part of the image. Sometimes it adds to the image. Uh, I think that we place too much emphasis on technical perfection and not enough on the emotional impact. Uh, so truthfully, I don't worry about it a lot. And I, I wish we were together so you could see some of my prints and uh, so you could see the quality of them and know uh, how noise impacts me. It really doesn't a lot. Someday we will actually get to see your prints in, in person. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to do that. Uh, again, just looking through uh, the comments, I can see Mushira Mudra asks the question, how can we make interconnections among the images in the portfolio? That's a great question because I find a lot of people have never tried to work on a portfolio before a, a cohesive body of work. They tend to be like me where you just go from greatest hit to greatest hit. And I think that you can start off with something that you love, a subject that you love. I had a woman the other day who wrote me and said she saw two plants that had just emerged in her garden and they formed a little heart. So she was going to be looking for symbols in nature. Uh, some people will go to, like I've done, to Death Valley and make a portfolio about Death Valley. It's tied in there by a geographic location. Uh, so you got to find something you're passionate about, something you have a vision for. It's just not a subject you've chosen. And then you just really want to try to find images that are all on that same theme. I, I could mind one about isolated, lonely trees, isolated from the other trees. Now, interestingly, I had a friend who believed that the key to success in a portfolio was having a unique subject, but he had a quandary because he said everything had been photographed. So one day he wrote me and said, frozen chickens. And I said, what? And he said, frozen chickens. No one has ever taken photographs with a frozen chicken in every image. And I'm thinking, no, there, no one has probably ever done that. And there's probably a reason why. So he thought he could become unique by doing something like that, and that would create success. I don't believe that. Uh, I don't strive for unique. I strive for honesty and integrity. And that means creating something that I have seen for myself, I have a vision for, and I have a passion for. And I would say vision and passion are two key ingredients to a portfolio. Find something you really love. Find it and go for it. And as you say yourself, don't ignore the technical things because you will find a way to bring about your vision. Um, again, just to remind people if you have any questions, yes, and JR has just put in a question for you, Cole. What are your thoughts on artificial intelligence? <laughs> well, as it relates to photography, I have no doubt it will be useful in the future, perhaps for creating images for advertising or maybe technical journals. I think it'll find a useful place, but do I think it's a photograph? No. Do I think it's art? No. And will I speak ever any more about it? No. It's not worthy of my attention. Output. I think I would agree with you on that, definitely. Um, Thanks, so, JR. <laughs> I said we were going to have an international uh, audience this evening, Cole, and we certainly do because we have been. Right. From Los Angeles and the rest coast of the states, all the way through to New Zealand, uh, even spanning different time zones, different days. It's actually it's actually Saturday now for people in New Zealand. So um, just to, to follow up on 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 the comments of it here, I mean they are so so positive and so uh, impressed by your presentation. And I would just join my voice with all of those as well, and the people here to say thank you very very much for. Uh, a stunning presentation, really interesting, and one that is going to uh, hopefully challenge, but more importantly, inspire everybody to go away and to become more concerned and more interested and more proactive in our own photographic visions. So on behalf of everybody who's been here, Cole, just very, very big thank you. And I'll give you a round of applause. You can't hear it, but at least you'll see my hand. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. And, uh... If anybody would like to write me later, I'd love to hear from you.
Okay, and just to remind people, you can find Cole's website. It's coldthompson.com, I think. Coldthompsonphotography.com. Coldthompsonphotography.com. Uh, do you have an Instagram account, by the way? I do, but I wouldn't even know how to tell you what that word is to find me. Just asking there. So, yes, you think you might just have to go continue your search for, for Cole on Instagram. Um, so, and if there are no other questions from people in the audience i think maybe at this stage we'll say uh, goodbye to everybody and uh, no matter where you happen to be enjoy the remainder of your day whether you're starting it or whether you're finishing it as i am here in ireland and hopefully Cole, hopefully we will get to meet you at some stage in person i really would love to do that thanks okay. so much thank you for Cole, and all. thank you to everybody here goodbye now everybody take care bye-bye goodbye thank you bye-bye